So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, first of all, let me thank Hilda, Gregors, and uh, of course, Amici for the invitation. It's, it's really, believe me, a pleasure to come here. I, 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 I definitely try to come every time you uh, invited me, and unfortunately, it was not possible one of these years, but I still remember very well the fantastic meetings that we had in, in Gdansk, in Nice, so here I am again in the, this very you know, beautiful city that I haven't seen before. So thank you very much for the invitation and thanks, of course, for also the engagement that Amici has been having with EOPA during a number of years. I've seen there Sylvia that is quite close to all our colleagues there and we have been enjoying definitely good cooperation from your side. So thank you very much. I think that's most, most uh, beneficial for us also. Now, um, what I would like to talk to you a little bit today is uh, where are we uh, right now in terms of this um, journey of um, both regulation and supervision in the, in the insurance side at the European level. And um, the motto of this, uh, of this panel, you know, about protecting consumers, I think this is something which is, of course, at the heart of all the changes that we have been making in the latest years, both on the regulatory and the supervisory, on the supervisory side. You know that protection of policyholders and overall protection of consumers is, of course, uh, the basic fundamental principle of, of the reform of Solvency II. And this is something, of course, that it's close to our heart at AOPA and that we really want to uh, implement in the right way. And, of course, also there's a number of initiatives on the more conduct of business side, if we can call it like that. So I will try to go a little bit along these two areas and to... Um, to express, I would say, where, where we are right now. So on, on Solvency II, of course, we concluded uh, the, the bulk of the regulatory side. We still have some elements here and there that are being fine-tuned, but you know, the, the phase of regulation is definitely concluded. We are now in the implementation uh, side, and that's, of course, very much uh, important. A journey has ended, but a new journey has started. And uh, the new journey, it's of course the journey of uh, the implementation in, in a consistent and convergent way throughout, throughout Europe. And that's where I think things uh, uh, need, of course, to be unfold and develop in the coming, in the coming years. And very often when, uh, when you know, we talk, because this is of course one of the main priorities of EOPA, this element of supervisory convergence, very often, often people uh, ask, you know, but what is that? And it's a good question because, you know, we're, we're not uh, uh, going ahead with supervisory convergence just for the sake of being convergent. You know? If we're all converging to a bad place, that's not a good thing. So we want supervisory convergence basically to achieve three main elements. First one, to make, to make sure that, you know, this regulation that we have been building is applied in all member states in the European Union. And you may say, ah, but that's evident, think twice. It's something that we really need to make sure that it will happen in practice. Second objective is that there is a level playing field between the different competitors, you know, <clears throat> not only, of course, on the same country, but also, of course, in the internal market cross-border. And the third element of supervisory convergence is to make sure that there is a similar level of protection of all of us as European consumers in the internal market, in the sense that supervision, the quality of supervision and what supervision pursues at the end of the day protects consumers in the different countries in a similar high level. And that is something which is definitely very important for supervision. Now, the role of IOPA, as you well know, is not to be the supervisor. No. The supervisors, the ones that supervise the market, of course, are the national authorities. They are the ones responsible for day-to-day -day supervision. Now, what is the role of AOPA then on this? Well, the role of AOPA is basically to ensure that the system is implemented in a consistent and convergent way, that we achieve this level of quality of supervision, and adding two elements, I would say, to the system. Firstly, to ensure that we as AOPA, and AOPA it's not just us in Frankfurt, AOPA is every you know, national authority, we are all AOPA, that we as uh, the authorities of supervision in the insurance uh, side in Europe, 
that we bring an added value to the system and that we make the system of supervision more efficient. That's the first thing. And I will tell you a number of examples on how are we putting this in practice. But the second element is also a responsibility of AOPA is to, of course, have a look on the supervisory practices that are done at the national level, to give our constructive feedback to the national authorities, and also to challenge them in certain circumstances. These two elements need to go hand in hand. First one, to provide added value and efficiency to the supervisory system. Second element, to provide constructive feedback views and, of course, challenge also to the national, to the national authorities. Now, how are, we, how are we going to put this in practice? Well, a number, of, a number of elements. I can mention to you a few of them. First of all, we're developing already since last year and we are in full speed ahead, I would say, right now. And just have yesterday another one of the meetings that I share. We are building a supervisory handbook. What is this? These are basically good practices of supervision in the different areas of Solvency II. So we look at the different areas where, of course, supervisors need to interact with the market to apply the regime, and we build good practices that are, of course, built up by everybody together to recognize what are the best practices in the different areas and to put them in a way that helps the national supervisors that are interacting with all of you in the day-to-day -day supervision that they do things in a more convergent and consistent way. A second example, you know, I know, and we, we will definitely have the opportunity to come back to that, you, uh, uh, you have problems with the reporting, of course. You know, I can tell you how we use the reporting of Solvency II. You know, we received uh, in, in AOPA uh, a lot of information, of course, we're starting to receive it right now through the national authorities. We have a centralized database with all this information on the different areas of uh, Solvency II. And we are building, of course, a number of tools, indicators, early warnings, risk analysis that we, we will then also give down directly to the national authorities. And this will be a powerful tool in terms of making sure that the analysis from the supervision side are becoming more and more consistent and that we have a much more integrated way of looking at, at supervision. This, I think, will bring a lot of efficiency also to the system because nowadays we have situations, for example, in home host business where there needs to be a lot of flows of information between home and host authorities. And you know, when there is flows of information between authorities, at the end it will come back to you because they will request this and that. Now we're, we're taking advantage of having a centralized database to uh, know, fill this and then give out to the different supervisors the information that uh, they need for their supervisory uh, practices on a daily basis. Another example, of course, there are inconsistencies and we start to see them, of course. You know? And let me be very honest on this, it's only natural. You know, I'm saying this for uh, a long time already. If we believe that uh, we would have a, a regulatory regime and then in the 1st of January 2016, every supervisor will have the same way of implementing all this regulation in the different countries, yeah, no, that's not reality. We have different cultures of supervision. We have different uh, expectations also from supervisors. We have different ways of dealing with the market. And these you cannot just basically harmonize or converge in one day. Now, what we're doing is definitely using our tools appropriately to get to a more convergent place, but this is a journey. Now, what we're doing in relation to the inconsistencies that we see around, we are looking at them, we're you know, touching on the most relevant material ones, and we're issuing supervisory opinions where we recommend practices in relation to certain specific aspects. We have done it, that for, for example, the treatment of sovereign risk. We have done that to the group capital calculations. We're working on a number of projects, what we call consistency projects, where we will come up with you know, one interpretation. And this is very important also for all of you because it's natural that during a number of you know, years, there will, of course, be different approaches by the national authorities. We also want to understand, really, especially the ones that are material. So please, you know, 
also make us aware of where you see the major inconsistencies because we will then, of course, try to um, get it to a more convergent place and to have one uh, interpretation at the, at the European level. But also, we are making visits to the national authorities. So we have a small team, but a very good team of people that is making visits to the national authorities, understanding how they are implementing the regime, and of course taking lessons from you know, all the sides, giving input, but also giving this constructive criticism, as I've mentioned, and feedback to the authorities also, to make sure that we move towards, uh, I would say, a better consistent way. And it's also about you know, having, giving support to national authorities to make uh, you know, supervision in the markets you know, coming to a, a better place. You know, we, have done, we have done an exercise which I thought, I think it's a very good exercise in Romania, where we basically you know, looked upon the, the market and then tried to uh, understand where the major risks were and the position of the market. And I think that that was very important to have a kind of a new start in terms of the basis overall in the market in there. And I think that the conditions right now are much better than what they were a number of uh, months ago. So this is what we can do also to help the national authorities in the different markets to, of course, upgrade uh, the situation and the practices. And also we have a tool called peer reviews, where we have colleagues from all over the countries in Europe you know, looking at a specific issue, having an analysis in all the countries, how things are done, and then making recommendations afterwards. We have done a number of them, and we will continue to do definitely, especially, of course, on the implementation of Solvency II. So this is, you know, what is the role of AYOP and how we envisage our, uh, our role and how we're going to pursue this role on supervisory convergence. Now, let me, let me mention to you a little bit one issue and one subject that I know it's very important for you. And uh, I remember, you know, in all the, uh, I would say, the, 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 the meetings that I've been present, it's always an important element in the discussion. Proportionality. Definitely. You know, I used to say that I'm coming from a small country. I know what is proportionality and what it makes sense. And I, so I attract definitely a very important, uh, uh, I would say, uh, relevance to this issue. And I, I remember, you know, during the discussions of the building up of the directive and Carol is in there, I'm seeing him uh, and he knows what I'm talking about. I was always pushing for elements of proportionality because I really believe that that makes a lot of sense. But proportionality doesn't mean that you don't apply the requirements. Please don't take it in that direction. You know, your customers, they don't deserve less protection than all the others. I think that that will be bad for your presence in the market if there's the perception that, you know, that bigger companies or commercial companies have one treatment and that the mutual sector, the cooperative sector has another treatment. It needs to be proportional. And we are committed, and I think we have done a lot in terms of proportionality in insolvency too, and we will continue to be committed in the future, of course, to look at how this is implemented. Let me just give a few examples. One of the examples that we know it's difficult, it's of course about the governance system, the key functions, all these elements related to governance. You know, I think that we came a long way in the directives and in the implementation measures and in the guidelines of AIOPA, you know, trying to recognize simplifications, ways that you can, of course, implement all these, uh, all these governance requirements in a proportionate way by using, uh, uh, you know, by using outsourcing, by having the possibility to combine the different functions, but always you know, trying to refuse one concept, which is the concept that we should have a threshold and then the ones that are upper the threshold have one treatment and the ones that are below a threshold have another treatment. I don't think that this is a good policy. It's up to you to see how the principles that are embedded in the regulation can be better implemented in your own reality. And then there should be a dialogue with the supervisors. And the supervisors should, of course, be uh, having a proportionate mindset also on how to implement the regime. Is this something which is the easiest way? No. 
it could be easier to set thresholds, but believe me, I don't think that that will be the best result at the end of the day. We want to have proportionality being in there for the risks, the nature and the complexity of the business. It's not about amounts of premiums or things like that. We have done a lot, as I said, on the governance side, but we have done a lot also on reporting. I know that's a difficult issue. I know that there's very different cultures in Europe, by the way. You know, we had a number of countries. When we started this process, we understood what was the reality. We had a number of countries in Europe that have huge reporting requirements already. And a, a group of countries that will have much less. I think that what we achieved nowadays, it's more or less in a little bit in between. And I, I know and I understand that it's difficult, of course, especially for smaller companies to implement this in one go. I think we, have, we had good time also to, you know, to understand better the requirements. We are very happy with the cooperation, as I said, that uh, we have with you. Trying to answer your questions, to make, you know, to make your life easier in terms of implementation. There's all these requirements that were inputted in there in the directive, also in terms of the 20% the of the market that can be exempted from uh, reporting in different areas, on the quarterly reporting, also on the annual reporting. So. I think we have made a tremendous effort in this direction. Now, as all in, uh, in life, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So we need to see, of course, now how this works in reality, how the implementation of these exemptions and of these proportionality elements are done by the national authorities. We are monitoring that, we're collecting information, but we need, of course, to make sure that this works in, in real world. And you have got a commitment from my side that will be very attentive to this. In no way we want the result of Solvency II to be that smaller companies will be put out of the business just because of more burden. That's not the objective, okay? Very clearly. And if we see that that is happening in some way, we will be attentive and I think we will, of course, change things in the right direction if that's, if that's the case. Now, what have we done also? We, and we have done it the utmost that you know, a small entity like ourselves uh, can do. We developed, for example, a tool for undertakings that allowed a huge number of companies around Europe, probably some of yours that are here today, to go for the XBRL reporting. This is something that can, you know, initially when we started this, I thought mm, maybe this will not be so much important. Now when I see the numbers, the blessed numbers we've got is that more than 1,200 companies in Europe are using this tool. They have used this tool to move from one reporting system to the other. That helped to move to XBRL. So that's, I think, an important element about helping the market also to make this move and to have a proportionate, a proportionate treatment. Now, let me come to the more consumer protection uh, area. And just first of all, let me remind one thing, because sometimes there is this idea that, uh, you know, prudential regulation, it's one thing, and then consumer protection is another thing. You know, for me, and I've been saying this very often, prudential regulation, it's the first element of consumer protection. You know, the first and the most important element for a consumer is to have the, I would say to be uh, having the, uh, the understanding and being, uh, I would say, conscious that the companies that are, you know, uh, taking the responsibilities, the liabilities and getting the risk, that they are soundly managed, and that they are well capitalized, that they will be there to, uh, you know, to deliver on the commitments that they take on the consumers. That's the first element of consumer protection and we should never forget that. Now, of course, there's other elements in terms of consumer protection. And in the latest years, these, all these elements about the conduct of business, the way that you treat your consumers have gained, of course, a much more important and relevant uh, and relevance. And I think it's for good reasons also, because all of us as consumers, we are much more aware of our rights. We are much more demanding. And I think that that's, that's a good thing, rightly so. I think we should value that definitely. Now, what, what have been done in this area? I would say that the regulatory phase is coming to a close also in, the, in this area. You know, you know, of course, the insurance distribution directive that is now being uh, 
in, you know, in the implementation uh, phase. We are now preparing our advice to the, uh, to the European Commission on the implementing acts. Things which are difficult that are there, we know, you know it also, handling things like uh, suitability requirements, things like uh, how to deal with conflicts of interest, uh, product oversight and governance. So all these elements that are in there and of course that we will come with the consultation, uh, you know, we will have a period soon of consultation after, after June in order to uh, make sure that we hear, of course, the market on this important implementation. And then, of course, there's also an important piece of work on the, the package return investment insurance products. You know, the famous PRIPS, we use all these acronyms. Of course, with, this, uh, with the implementation of this key information document, trying to get in three pages, which I can tell you it's not an easy task. You know, to get in three pages some more I would say, uh, comparable information on the risks, the costs, and the performance of, of products. So this is, I think, when we finalize this phase, I think that the bulk of the regulatory phase on the conduct side, on the more conduct side, is, is over. But there's also the other element, which is, of course, what supervision do we have in this area? And let me just uh, uh, take a little bit of a... Uh, some minutes on this issue because I think it's particularly uh, relevant for the sector and for supervision. I think that the worst thing that can happen to the insurance sector is that uh, we let things go without challenging what we see and let, at the end of the day, consumer detriment happening. And we had, of course, gladly not so many cases as we've seen in the, in the banking side, but we still have some issues, and we had some issues in the past. And I think that the attitude needs to be firstly from the insurance side, from the market, to be very attentive to this. Because this can be, and you, you know in different countries that these elements have occurred, this can be definitely very bad for the consumers themselves when this happens, but also for the reputation of the overall sector. And we have seen in some countries some areas of business being basically wiped out because there's not anymore the trust and the confidence in the insurance sector. And that I think collectively the market and supervisors we need to avoid. So from my side the message has been already consistently for a number of years. We need to be more preventive we need to have also a more risk-based approach on the conduct of business side, also in terms of supervision. And if you look at the initiatives that we have been having and why we attract so much importance to some of them, they come precisely directly to this issue. You know, we wanted to have outside these preparatory guidelines on, on the, the product oversight and governance ahead of IDD, not because you know we wanted to have more burden or you know that's not the point you, know, you will implement that when the directive wants you to implement it in 218 but it's such an important issue that it's extremely relevant that supervisors and the industry have a good understanding a good dialogue on what does this mean because this is not just you know hiring an outside consultant to made you a number of calculations for calculating a solvency capital requirement. This is much deeper. This is about the way, the way the culture inside the companies works, the way that product development is done, the way that you look at consumers, the way that you definitely take the responsibility, and this should be at the top. You take the responsibility for what you put out there. And this tone from the top, it's fundamental. And that's where I believe really that mutuals, you can have an advantage because it's in your, it's in your veins, the protection of consumer. And I would really, you know, like that you give the example. When we talk and we have been putting this outside very often, please put the consumers at the heart of your business. Because that's a win-win situation for also for the industry from a commercial view you can definitely deliver that message much better than others. You should be on the forefront of this. And I th I'm seeing very good examples around Europe and I think that's very important. There needs to be a tone from the top in relation to the product design, the way that you choose the target market, 
the way that you choose the distributors, the way that you look at the claims. It's about ethics. It's about having a culture where consumers are the most important thing in your business at the end of the day. And this is something that, believe me or not, this will not go away. This will be there because this is what us, overall as citizens, demand from the financial sector. This will not go away. We need an ethics culture to be at the center of the financial business. This is fundamental and we will keep, of course, pushing in this, in this direction. Now, what are we doing also from a supervisory perspective is to try to take an angle where we are also more preventive in the way that we do supervision in this area. Preventive in the sense that we want to try to analyze and look at where the priorities should be in order to be possible to get there before things go wrong, before consumer detriment uh, you know, uh, appears. And that supervision can give, of course, the good incentive and the right, and the right incentive. And that's what we want to do. So when we are developing tools like, for example, indicators, risk, what we call risk-based indicators, where we try to look at things like level of commissions, claims ratios, etc., it's not that because we want to take uh, you know, uh, care of prices or whatever. That's not our purpose. But if you look at what happened in a number of situations in the past, it was clear that the linkage between really low claims ratios and high level of commissions in certain circumstances showed that there were conflicts of interest. And when there are conflicts of interest, the possibility to have detriment to consumers is definitely bigger. It doesn't mean that will happen all the time, but it means that it's bigger. So we need to prioritize where we want to, of course, look upon. And this is what we will continue to do. Also through another tool that uh, we call uh, the thematic reviews. So we will look upon elements that we want to look from a European perspective, specific issues where we will collect information in order to see if we need to go deeper. We're starting with the pilot already uh, uh, now. We're looking at uh, the interlinkages in unit link between insurance companies and asset managers and the possible conflicts that are, that are there. And we will come back, of course, later on um, with conclusions from this analysis. So just to give you a flavor that in this area, our strategy is definitely to push for more culture of ethics that starts from the top, that puts consumers at the center, and from a supervisory perspective, that at the end of the day is more preventive and risk-based. Risk now, just to finalize, I think that I'm exceeding already my time by two minutes. We understand, and I particularly I understand that, of course, these have been demanding times for the industry. And this is something that, believe me, we take into due account when we take decisions also from our side at the, at the supervisory side. Now, we will be definitely looking at this implementation, looking at evidence, and as I said, in areas where there's evidence that we're having unintended consequences from the regime, we will definitely take action in order to, you know, to change it if needed. We need evidence. It's not just a reaction that, uh, no, these things are going uh, badly. We need evidence to understand, you know, with numbers, with consequences, be it on the investment, be it on the products, being done effects on consumers, and we will gonna collect this evidence during, of course, this period of years. And we really want to engage with you. And I'm sure that uh, we will continue to have a fantastic cooperation as we have been having in these latest years. And I, I really appreciate that. Now, I've got some questions for you. As Hilde mentioned, there's some questions so that you know now how to use this. So if you can put on the screen the first the first question. Here we go. So first question. Overall, what are the real needs for consumers? Firstly, 
more simple and standardized products. Second, to receive less information, but more comparable information on the different products. Third one, to be ensured that insurers avoid conflict of interest. Or for all of the above. So now you can push your buttons. And I'm looking forward to see the results. Very good. I can subscribe definitely that. So I was thinking on the responses, of course, before, uh, and I was, I was betting with myself that with this audience, I, will have, I would have the D. You know, it will be different with other audiences, I'm sure. So congratulations on that one. I think to have 40% on all of the above, I think it's very good. And it's interesting also that uh, the level of information it's also uh, very high on the agenda. Very good. Second question. As I mentioned in my intervention, insurers should put customers at the heart of their business. This is kind of a slogan. Eh? What should be the first priority to follow this principle? One, to focus on the needs of my clients when developing the new products. Second, to be fully transparent about guarantees, costs, and charges of my products. Three, to ensure that my staff working directly with clients are consumer-oriented. Difficult, huh? Four, I can choose. All three above statements are equally important. Here we go. I knew it. Hmm. Now, this is why I come all the time in here, you know, it's perfect audience. 45.6, <laughs> even more striking than the first one. Definitely, I think that that's what we mean when we mention about putting the consumer at the center. I think it's very important. So I take from the, from the results that uh, uh, you believe that uh, um, the least important one is that the staff working directly with the clients are consumer oriented. Maybe because you already have them, so that's probably the, the reason. But I think it's it's a challenge. Definitely in the in the world of digitalization, maybe we can come back to that in the questions and answers. Very good. Last question. And this is, you know, you need to take some risks, of course, also as a supervisor. So Coming to this conference, I wanted to, of course, make a question about PRIPS. It's a risk, I know. Here we go. We have developed the ESAS, the key information document for PRIPS, as you know. How do you perceive this proposal? One, it will help retain investors to make informed decisions by increasing their awareness about risks, performance, and costs. So a very positive one. Second, it's a good idea, but its implementation will be very expensive and time-consuming for the industry. Third, I don't think that this proposal delivers on its objectives. Here we go. Let's see if I will... I, I will... <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm curious. Aha! Uh -huh. uh -huh. Not so bad. Not so bad, to be very honest. So, the risk is definitely something that uh, both on the industry but also on the supervisor side, it's there. So, I took my risk. Not so bad. 44%. It's a good idea, but of course, it's going to take time. I also uh, agree, understand. And that's why we are very keen, of course, to have very good contacts and cooperation with you with the market to make sure that we can implement it in a way that at the end of the day will deliver on the objectives. I take the point that close to 38% well, says it's not going to deliver on the objectives. So, well, 
for for the supervisor, it's, it's also important to understand that uh, we have still a long way to go in terms of communication in this issue. And uh, you may be sure that we were going to have that communication line in order to deliver on the objectives of this uh, regulation. Thank you very much. And I will be, of course, very open to questions also from your side. Oh, would you prefer to sit? No, no, I can. I can okay, sit. good. Um, thank you for this. Very important, some very valid and important statements to us. And uh, we always appreciate your wisdom and we always appreciate your willingness to share the, your views with us. Now we have time for a few questions and I will take the, exec the executive privilege and ask the first question myself. Um, you mentioned during the, your, your presentation that the supervisor will need to see how the new regulations will work in practice. There is a time frame for a review of the effects of the new law. Do you see a role for the industry and for the mutuals, uh, for representatives of the, uh, of the industry in that review? And if so, what kind of a role and how would you like us to interact with yeah. you? Now that's a very good, uh, good question, mm -hmm. Gregor. And then that allows me a little bit also to explain where we are in the process. So you may know, of course, that uh, in Solvency 2, there are basically two periods set for uh, this review. The first one, which is uh, with the objective in 2018 to have a review of the calibrations in terms of the risk components of the solvency capital requirement, which makes sense because, of course, these things have been calibrated already many years ago, and so there's evolutions. There will be hopefully better data, etc. So that's one of the processes of review. And then there's the overall, overall review of the system that will touch on all the areas that will come later in uh, 2021. So that, you know, you can think, oh, that's a long time. No, we are already, of course, putting things in practice to look at this. And let me just mention what we are doing from on the first one, or the closer to, uh, of course, to us, to 18, on the revision of the calibrations and the solvency capital requirement. We have initiated a process at AOPA where we had first an high level discussion on what are the objectives, the three fundamental elements that we want to cover with this review. And this is clear, settled from now. So from an AOPA side, the three main elements that we want to look upon is first one, to reduce complexity. We believe that in the standard formula and in the areas surrounding the SCR calculations, that we could do some reduction of complexity to have some more simplicity in some areas. And so this is definitely an objective that we have. Second objective, enhance proportionality. It's very clear. As I said, we believe that we have done a good job on proportionality, but now it's of course time to look at if it works in practice, and we will definitely be open and willing to look at areas where we can increase the element of proportionality. We have already some ideas, uses of undertaking specific parameters, for example, by the companies in other areas that are not covered right now, but also in terms, of course, of uh, the simplifications uh, in, the, in the systems, in the calculations. And the third objective is to continue to pursue, I would say, a good balance between risk sensitiveness on the one side, because the system is risk-based, and procyclicality, because of course, every time you have a risk-based regime, you have an element of procyclicality. What we need is to balance this. I think we have a number of tools in the regime already to deal with this, but we want to analyze this, that to assess, and if we need to fine tune the tools in there, we should go for it in terms of this, this balance. So these are the three main objectives, high level that we have put it for this revision. And of course, we will, we're starting the work. Of course, we will have then, of course, uh, requests from the European Commission also to work in this area. But what I can promise you is that, of course, we are going to have different stages of consultation. As always, we will do it formal consultations. We will have informal consultations. We will have the role of our stakeholder group, where, of course, Amici has also representation. So we will be quite transparent. And more than that, we are eager to receive your contributions, you know, with the reality, with what is making more difficult your life at the end of the day, with the objective of implementing the regime in a sound, in a sound manner. 
This will be a process, of course. For 2021, there's, of course, a bigger, wide, more wide revision, but definitely uh, these will be the processes that we will be implementing very much, of course, open to uh, have an engagement with the industry and with the different, with the different of course, uh, uh, I would say, sensitivities and the different uh, learning elements from different parts of the industry, which I think is important. There's no one-size-fits-all approach in this world. Excellent. I think we're very happy to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, time for questions from the audience. We have time for two questions. Um, I'm sure there are microphones in the audience. Okay. Sir, please. Thank you. It functions, yes. You were talking about a supervisory handbook. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, will that also be available for the insurance market? <laughs> That's the hundred dollar question. That <laughs> now you know, we have uh, we have started to work on that last year, as I mentioned, and, and that's one element that since the beginning was clear was that we keep this for supervisors only. I'm not saying that there will not be parts of it that could be, of course, uh, um, you know, disclosed later on, but uh, for the time being, we we keep it for supervisory use, and just you know. It's nothing that it's a uh, secret. It's not that. But it's important. No, no, let me, let, let me just explain, you know, very transparently. You know, if, if I wanted to have this disclosed since the beginning, believe me, we would never achieve what we have achieved already. Okay? That's clear. And I can tell you, I've been a supervisor. You know, I've passed all these, <laughs> all these jobs. I've been a supervisor during a number of years in my life. I would have loved, as a young supervisor, to have this kind of material at that point in time. This is really good stuff. This is really good quality. This puts risk-based supervision where it should be, which is not a checkbox, a checklist, that people will come to you and the company saying, oh, where are you now? Tick, tick, tick. No. That's not solvency too. So what we're what we are developing, it's really risk-based. It's a basis for a good dialogue between the supervisor and the companies. And also challenge, because that's what makes good supervision, the capacity to challenge the, the companies. So we're building this. I'm sure that in the future there will be parts that we're going to release. That's a discussion that we will have. But for the time being, we want to keep this in sight. All right, thank you. Um Two and three. Thank you. I would liked your speech, especially when you spoke about consistency and proportionality. So I'm motivated to put the following question. Please. I suppose you are aware that in some countries, supervisory authorities impose IFRS accounting to non-coded insurance groups yeah. in addition to solvency 2 reporting. Do you have an opinion on that? Well, there's two elements in here. As you know, when we started developing Solvency 2, there was the idea, which I think, looking back now, it's probably a little bit idealistic, that uh, we should pursue a way to have only one base, because that would be the most efficient, you know, to have IFRS accounting and then Solvency 2 based on that. IFRS never developed until now, on the insurance side, we're still waiting for, of course, the, the standards. So at some point in time, we had to give it away. Now, we have, of course, for Solvency 2, a basis of valuation. Now, there is flexibility in the, in the regulation to uh, um, implement that. So there will be definitely countries that will use the closest thing to the accounts that uh, they are, they're having in their countries already because it's definitely close to the Solvency 2 basis, there will be others that we will need to, of course, uh, request some more information. That is difficult, you know, to, to have a full consistency because, of course, we cannot touch, that's not our task, on the accounting, on the accounting side and on the accounting elements. I recognize that this, is, this can be a burden and what we will try to do is to see, you know, from, a compli from a, an implementation perspective, to see how this flexibility that is embedded in there is used. 
and how consistent is uh, you know, the way that supervisors are looking at it. I know that in a number of countries, for example, supervisors have allowed to use the local accounts with some elements on top for the Solvency 2 basis because there's not such material differences. In other countries, it will be more difficult to have that, uh, that, uh, that implementation. That is something that we are looking on, of course, and uh, we will come back, you know, let's see how this develops. But I think it's difficult, really, to have full consistency in this area. All right, thank you. And your final question to you. Could we have the microphone, please? Thank you. Hi, my name is Maria Westerberg from Folksam in Sweden. Yeah. Um, you were talking about PRIPS, the PRIPS regulation, yeah. and uh, uh, according to what you're saying, telling us today, it appears that Europa understands the fact that this will be time requiring for the insurance companies, yeah. considering then the, that the, the final version came here in April. Uh, we also, uh, when we saw the final version, realized that some of the requirements doesn't fit insurance products that well or as well as we expected. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in, in particular, mutuals, it, it would be quite, it, some of the elements required are quite foreign for, mm -hmm. uh, for mutuals. Uh, will EUPA, considering yeah. all this, do any efforts to postpone um, <laughs> the, the, the date of uh, entering into force of the pre-regulation? Yeah. Well, that's a very good question, and, and, and thank you for that, because it allows me also to, to explain, you know. Some people may say that we are a powerful institution, but you know, we're not as powerful as that. So, of course, we, you know, we cannot change what is in the level one texts of the directive. You know, that's, that's a given. It's in there. We delivered on time, but we cannot change the implementation date. Now, of course, we have been in close contact with the Commission and with the Parliament, and I've I've made this point already publicly in an hearing in the Parliament, so I'm not saying nothing new completely. Personally, I've got some sympathy from the argument from the industry that you would need a little bit more time for the implementation. And basically for two reasons. One, it's what you mentioned, it, that of course there are some concepts in there that are a little bit alien and that you would need a little bit more time to first understand them fully and of course put them in practice, but also a second element, which I think it's really relevant, which is to ensure that there is time for communication between supervisors and the industry in order to ensure that when these documents will come out, they will be consistent throughout the different countries in the EU. And that I think it's very important if you want to achieve the objectives that are there. Now, this being said, I really want you to Keep the momentum. You know, please don't think or don't uh, you know believe that this that this is about uh, uh, you know going to the calendars. You know, it, it should not be. You know, I think we should not keep the momentum. What you what you have from our side definitely is the commitment that we are open to discussion to a dialogue. We will we want to start as soon as possible as when the commission, of course, will issue the, the regulatory technical standard to start as soon as possible a process of question and answers. Our intention is to put this in our websites. Uh, now we have a website of the Joint Committee also, so that all the questions should be, should be there. And we will try to, of course, come with uh, the best uh, you know, uh, advice from our side in terms of implementation of what is in the, in the text. We should not lose the momentum, but politically, that's where that question needs to be made. You know, I'm being very clear and transparent that saying that I've got some sympathy, I cannot change this because of course it's in the, in the level one. But please engage with us. You know, that's my message. If you have questions on how things apply, if you have elements specifically on the mutuals on certain products, how these apply, please engage with us. Believe me, we made a tremendous effort with a very difficult area because the number of products that you have out there in the financial sector is so huge. It's easy to say, of course, that you don't like it. Believe me, it's very difficult to arrive at consistency between three sectors on so much different products and to have a text that where you can, of course, put in practice. So I recognize that there could be questions, 
that implementation is not easy. I would be supportive of having a little bit more time to, to get there, but not losing the momentum. And we want, of course, to, to engage with you, so please come to us and pose the questions, and we will do the best on our side to be effective and answering. Mr. Bernardino, thank you. We'll hold you to your word. Mr. Bernardino, yes. thank you.